so let me try again uh, today we will be talking about uh, the mapping of R2 locus, the genetic mapping of R2 locus of T4 bacteriophage and uh, this was done by a scientist Seymour Benzer and before going into the, the kind of work that he had done, I will just show you a bit of history and what I am showing you over here is that you can see Erwin Schrodinger written, he was a physicist and he worked on quantum mechanics and he wrote a book what is life okay. now he wanted to answer the fundamental biological questions using physical methods and he wanted to find out the distance of the gene and he wanted to know whether irradiation can help one to identify what is the size of the gene this he could think of because he was aware of Muller's work who worked on uh, irradiation and showed that chromosomes can be uh, broken or mutations can be created by irradiation. Okay. Now, one of his friends, uh, Max Delbrook, he was also a physicist, along with a genetist, N. V. Timofey Vrzovsky, they wrote a chapter that's quantum mechanical model of gene. Now, there were two people, two scientists, they were young people, and they, they read this book and they were impressed. One is James Watson, we all know about him. And the second person, there are many others, but I'm just, I've just written two over here, James Watson and Seymour Benzer. And uh, Seymour Benzer, he was also a physicist, and he was working on solid state uh, physics. And when he read this, he, was, he got converted into biologist, and he started working on the genetic map of, he got interested in T4 file and started working on it. And he created one of the most detailed genetic map that was ever made. Okay. Why do we say most detailed? Okay. Uh, before that, I've written over here Cistron. Now, Cistron is a term that is equivalent to gene now. But this term Cistron was coined by Seymour Benzer to define uh, the smallest unit that was not divisible by uh, mutation, recombination, that recombination would take place. Now why we say detailed map, because uh, he isolated, okay, 2000 or he, he mapped it's four 2400 mutants on the gene, on the chromosome. And these 2400 mutants were spread at 304 loci, later on 4 more loci was added, so that became 308. Now, what, what were the genes uh, he studied and what he did? Now, he worked on a gene that's called as R. R stands for rapid lysis. What is rapid lysis? As the name suggests, the lysis of the bacterial cells is enhanced. It increases. It does, it's very fast. So, therefore, as a result, you get larger plaques compared to the wild type. This is R plus. This is wild type. You get smaller plaques. Also, the morphology of the plaque is different. Here, the uh, plaque is fuzzy. Here, they have sharp functions. Now, what are these plaques? Plaques, many of you would know. But plaques are actually, uh, they are clear regions. If you have a lawn of bacteria, grow a lawn of bacteria, and you plate phages on them, the phages will infect the cell, lyse the cell. And the phages, so the bacterial cells are lysed. The phages spread out. And that gives you a clear structure. So what if you if there's a long bacteria you see clear clear spots and you can count them and they are called as phages. Now these phages can be grown on solid medium and they can be also grown on liquid culture. So if you have liquid culture or bacteria, you if you have seen bacterial cultures, you will see that they were all they are it's kind of turbid. But when you add phages to it, after some time you will find it becomes clear. That means all the bacterial cells have lice and only the phages are present in the solution. Now, uh, this R locus, there are three different regions of the, or three different R mutants. They are R1, R2, and R3. So you have three different uh, R mutants. You have R1, R2, and R3. Now, the reason why Mendel, uh, Benzer worked on R2 mutants, because they gave a selective advantage. What's the selective advantage? The selective advantage is that these mutants, they all grow on strain B of E. coli. 
So strain B is a permissive host. It allows all the mutants, R rapid lysis mutants to grow. Whereas R2 mutants are not able to grow on this strain that is K12 lambda. Which means that uh, you can separate the R1 mutants and the R3 mutants from the R2 mutants. So you can isolate the R2 mutants separately. So therefore E. coli strain B is a restrictive host which means it doesn't allow the R2 mutants to grow. So this was a very simple uh, test which Benzer used uh, dramatically for the gene mapping. Now when he, he isolated 2400 mutants, so what he did was he started first with doing complementation tests and when he did these complementation tests he found that, that the R2 locus it has actually two contiguous genes. So there are two gene segments which are one after another and these are two different units of function. So he named them as R2A and R2B. Okay. So all the mutants then which he isolated, he now put them in different different categories. They belong to either R2A or R2B and this was done by using the R2A and R2B mutants as reference points. What, what I mean is, for example, if you have a bacterial cell, this is cell that's K12 strain, you put R1 uh, uh, phage, you, you co-infect two phages. One is A1, let's say mutation in the A region, one, and this is uh, mutation in the B region, okay, one. So this A, which has mutation in the A region, let's say if this is, uh, so you have A and B. So this, uh, this A1 means there's a mutation somewhere in the A region over here. So as a result, this A, pro A region will not form the protein, but because B is okay, it will get the B polypeptide intact. On the other hand, this is uh, R2B1, where a mutation is somewhere in the B region. So therefore, you don't see the blue, uh, B polypeptide, but A polypeptide is, pre uh, is present. So this B1 is making A, this is making uh, B. So therefore now they are complementing each other and as a result you have these phages formed and lysis takes place. Okay, which means that these two are complementing with each other. Now suppose if you have a new, you have isolated a new mutant, you find out whether this mutation is in the A or in the B region. What you do is, this is the new mutant X. Now suppose if this is in A. Now if this is in A and if you are using A1 as a reference point, so both of them, because this, this mutation is in A, this is also in A. So as a result, the A polypeptide is missing, but this B is intact. So both of them are making the B polypeptide. Okay. So now because you have missing A, so therefore they don't lyse and so you don't see any lysis. On the other hand, the next second mutation which you have isolated is Y, let's say. And if Y is in B and then... Uh, because this is also B, so B are mutated, so you are getting only the A polypeptide and B is missing from here, so you don't see any protein. So this is the basic uh, criteria that Benzer used to characterize all these mutations, right? Now, <coughs> okay. uh, yeah. uh, before we talk about the next step, what it did, because Characterizing 2400 mutations at one go becomes a very tedious process and it would take a longer time. So he devised a new strategy where he used a deletion mapping and then that was much faster. But before we talk about the deletion mapping, I'll just tell you what information we get by uh, using this kind of a strategy. We can do uh, mapping. by we can do mapping by two factor crosses using complementation analysis one can categorize the mutants into a or b but then within a there are several mutants so you have to map them and we so therefore you have to find out the distance between them so distance can be found out by doing a recombination analysis now, what is this recombination analysis is, now suppose if, uh, let's say, take, let's take this one, 
there is a mutation in the A. Let's say the mutation is here. Okay, this A1 is here. And this is next is A2. Let's say. A2 is here. Now, because these are homologous chromosomes, so there is a high chance or there is a chance that they can be crossing over between these two. So, when there is crossing over with, between these two, then what you ultimately get is this is this will have A1 and this will have A2, the mutant one, right? On the other hand, this will be A1 that's normal. And this is B1, oh sorry, A2, that is normal. So this is a double mutant and this is a wild type. Okay. So what, what would you understand, what uh, you should understand is, it's uh, like this. Okay? So what you should understand is that using these four tests, you can do complementation tests as well as you can do a recombination tests. Now, when we do recombination test and when we see wild type, we know there's recombination taken place. So, therefore, what we can do is we can calculate the recombination frequency. So, what is this recombination frequency? This is equal to uh, number of recombinants, okay, divided by total number of plants. Now this number of recombinants that we have seen, we had a wild type and a double mutant. So the num so double mutants you will not be able to see, but wild type you will be able to see. So therefore you multiply this with 2. Okay. Now when I say you can see the wild type and so what we do is for, uh, for doing this recombination analysis, you grow them initially in the K12 strain. So in the K12 strain, all will grow the mutants as well as wild type uh, sorry you first grow them on the b strain okay when you grow them in the b strain as we have, have told you over here that the mutants will grow on the b strain but when you grow them in the on the k12 because k12 is a restrictive host so only the wild type progeny will grow so therefore after you so this, the way it is done is let's say if you have a flask of culture B cells, okay. Now, in this flask, you are putting A1 and A2, right? Now, this A1, A2, they will lyse the cells, and what you will get is you will get some non recombinants, which will be either A1 or A2. You will get some wild type X. And let's say you will get some double mutants, which is also X. So th these two are the recombinants, and this is the Y type. And you can count the total number of plants. Now, how do you do? How do you calculate the recombination frequency to find out the distance? What you do is, once you have, once you have done this, you have all the uh, phages in this solution. Now you divide them. And you grow, you dilute them, and you grow them on B, and you grow them on K. Okay, because this, the number of cells in the the which can grow on the K will be much less. So therefore, the dilution of this is much less. Okay, so therefore, the dilution is much less right now if this let's say you have diluted to 10 to the power minus 6 this is 10 to the power minus 4 so what you will get uh, let me show you and so if you are getting let's say uh, after this dilution you get let's drop this If you are getting, let's say, 250 plaques in strain B, okay. 
getting 250 flux in strain B, okay, which means that since this was diluted to the power 6, so you have 250 into 10 to the power 6, which is equal to 2.5 into 10 to the power 8. On the other hand, let's say after dilution, the double recombinants as well as the mutants, you have 300 into 10 to the power 4, which means 3 into 10 to the power 6. So to calculate, you have the recombinant in the total charge. So you have 3 into 10 to the power 6 divided by 2.5 into 10 to the power 8. And this comes to approximately uh, 0 0.012. Okay. So this recombination frequency is equal to this. So therefore, the distance between A1 and A2 can be calculated to 1.2 centimeter. So this is how you can calculate the distance between the two uh, mutants that you have isolated, right? Now, um, the, the, the beauty of this uh, technique is that even if there's a recombination in one in a million, that means if there is one recombinant in 10 to the power 6 flux, it can be identified. This can be identified. So this is... Uh, so this is about uh, the recombination frequency, right? Now, as this video is getting very large, so I'll stop here now. And uh, in the next part B, I'll talk about the deletion now.